This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Catherine Eastman, June 2007. Dream Days by Kenneth Graham. Section 7A The Reluctant Dragon. Part 1. Footprints in the snow have been unfailing provokers of sentiment ever since snow was first a white wonder in this drab-colored world of ours. In a poetry book presented to one of us by an aunt, there was a poem by one Wordsworth, in which they stood out strongly, with a picture all to themselves, too. But we didn't think very highly either of the poem or the sentiment. Footprints in the sand, now, were quite another matter and we grasped Crusoe's attitude of mind much more easily than Wordsworth's. Excitement and mystery, curiosity and suspense, these were the only sentiments that tracks, whether in sand or in snow, were able to arouse in us. We had awakened early that winter morning, puzzled at first by the added light that filled the room. Then, when the truth at last fully dawned on us, and we knew that snowballing was no longer a wistful dream, but a solid certainty waiting for us outside, it was a mere brute fight for the necessary clothes, and the lacing of boots seemed a clumsy invention, and the buttoning of coats an unduly tedious form of fastening, with all that snow going to waste at our very door. When dinner-time came, we had to be dragged in by the scruff of our necks. The short armistice over, the combat was resumed. But presently Charlotte and I, a little weary of contests and of missiles that ran shudderingly down inside one's clothes, forsook the trampled battlefield of the lawn, and went exploring the blank virgin spaces of the white worlds that lay beyond. It stretched away unbroken on every side of us, this mysterious soft garment, under which our familiar world had so suddenly hidden itself. Faint imprints showed where a casual bird had alighted, but of other traffic there was next to no sign, which made these strange tracks all the more puzzling. We came across them first at the corner of the shrubbery, and poured over them long, our hands on our knees. Experienced trappers that we knew ourselves to be, it was annoying to be brought up suddenly by a beast we could not at once identify. "'Don't you know?' said Charlotte, rather scornfully. "'Thought you knew all the beasts that ever was!' This put me on my mettle, and I hastily rattled off a string of animal names embracing both the Arctic and the Tropic Zones, but without much real confidence. "'No,' said Charlotte, on consideration, "'they won't any of them quite do.' "'Seems like something lizardy. "'Did you say an iguanodon? "'Might be that, perhaps. "'But that's not British, and we want a real British beast. "'I think it's a dragon.' "'Tisn't half big enough,' I objected. "'Well, all dragons must be small to begin with,' said Charlotte, "'like everything else. "'Perhaps this is a little dragon who's got lost. "'A little dragon would be rather nice to have. "'He might scratch and spit, but he couldn't do anything, really. "'Let's track him down.' So we set off into the wide, snow-clad world, hand in hand, our hearts big with expectation, complacently confident that by a few smudgy traces in the snow we were in a fair way to capture a half-grown specimen of a fabulous beast. We ran the monster across the paddock and along the hedge of the next field, and then he took to the road like any tame civilized taxpayer. Here his tracks became blended with and lost among more ordinary footprints, but imagination and a fixed idea will do a great deal, and we were sure we knew the direction a dragon would naturally take. The traces, too, kept reappearing at intervals, at least Charlotte maintained they did, and as it was her dragon, I left the following of the slot to her and trotted along peacefully, feeling that it was an expedition anyhow, and something was sure to come out of it. Charlotte took me across another field or two, and through a copse, and into a fresh road. And I began to feel sure it was only her confounded pride that made her go on pretending to see dragon tracks, instead of owning she was entirely at fault like a reasonable person. 
At last she dragged me excitedly through a gap in a hedge of an obviously private character. The waste open world of field and hedgerow disappeared, and we found ourselves in a garden, well kept, secluded, most undragon haunted in appearance. Once inside, I knew where we were. This was the garden of my friend the circus man, though I had never approached it before by a lawless gap from this unfamiliar side. And here was the circus man himself, placidly smoking a pipe as he strolled up and down the walks. I stepped up to him and asked him politely if he had lately seen a beast. "'May I inquire, he said with all civility, "'what particular sort of a beast you may happen to be looking for?' "'It's a lizardy sort of a beast,' I explained. "'Charlotte says it's a dragon, but she doesn't really know much about beasts.' The circus man looked round about him slowly. "'I don't think,' he said, "'that I've seen a dragon in these parts recently. "'But if I come across one, I'll know it belongs to you, "'and I'll have him taken round to you at once.' "'Thank you very much,' said Charlotte. "'But don't trouble about it, please, "'cause perhaps it isn't a dragon after all. "'Only I thought I saw his little footprints in the snow, "'and we followed him up, and they seemed to lead right in here. "'But maybe it's all a mistake, and thank you all the same.' "'Oh, no trouble at all,' said the circus man cheerfully. "'I should be only too pleased. "'But, of course, as you say, it may be a mistake. "'And it's getting dark, and he seems to have got away for the present, whatever he is. "'You'd better come in and have some tea. "'I'm quite alone, and we'll make a roaring fire. "'And I've got the biggest book of beasts you ever saw. "'It's got every beast in the world, and all of them coloured, "'and we'll try and find your beast in it.' "'We were always ready for tea at any time, "'and especially when combined with beasts.' There was marmalade, too, and apricot jam brought in expressly for us, and afterwards the beast book was spread out, and, as the man had truly said, it contained every sort of beast that had ever been in the world. The striking of six o'clock set the more prudent Charlotte nudging me, and we recalled ourselves with an effort from beast land, and reluctantly stood up to go. "'Here, I'm coming along with you,' said the circus man. "'I want another pipe, and a walk'll do me good. "'You needn't talk to me unless you like.' "'Our spirits rose to their wonted level again. "'The way had seemed so long, the outside world so dark and eerie, "'after the bright warm room and the highly coloured beast-book. "'But a walk with a real man, why, that was a treat in itself. "'We set off briskly, the man in the middle. "'I looked up at him, and wondered whether I should ever live to smoke a big pipe with that careless sort of majesty. But Charlotte, whose young mind was not set on tobacco as a possible goal, made herself heard from the other side. "'Now, then,' she said, "'tell us a story, please, won't you?' The man sighed heavily and looked about him. "'I knew it,' he groaned. "'I knew I should have to tell a story.' Oh, why did I leave my pleasant fireside? Well, I will tell you a story. Only let me think a minute. So he thought a minute, and then he told us this story. Long ago, might have been hundreds of years ago, in a cottage halfway between this village and yonder shoulder of the downs up there, a shepherd lived with his wife and their little son. Now the shepherd spent his days and at certain times of the year his nights too up on the wide ocean bosom of the downs with only the sun and the stars and the sheep for company and the friendly chattering world of men and women far out of sight and hearing but his little son when he wasn't helping his father and often when he was as well spent much of his time buried in big volumes that he borrowed from the affable gentry and interested parsons of the country round about. And his parents were very fond of him, and rather proud of him too, though they didn't let on in his hearing. So he was left to go his own way and read as much as he liked, and instead of frequently getting a cuff on the side of the head, as might very well have happened to him, he was treated more or less as an equal by his parents, 
who sensibly thought it a very fair division of labour that they should supply the practical knowledge and he the book learning they knew that book learning often came in useful at a pinch in spite of what their neighbours said what the boy chiefly dabbled in was natural history and fairy tales and he just took them as they came in in a sandwichy sort of way without making any distinctions and really his course of reading strikes one as rather sensible one evening the shepherd who for some nights past had been disturbed and preoccupied and off his usual mental balance came home all of a tremble and sitting down at the table where his wife and son were peacefully employed she with her seam he in following out the adventures of the giant with no heart in his body exclaimed with much agitation it's all up with me maria never no more can i go up on them there downs was it ever so now don't you take on like that said his wife who was a very sensible woman but tell us all about it first whatever it is has given you this shake-up and then me and you and the sun here between us we ought to be able to get to the bottom of it it began some nights ago said the shepherd you know that cave up there i never liked it somehow and the sheep never liked it neither and when sheep don't like a thing there's generally some reason for it well for some time past there's been faint noises coming from that cave noises like heavy sighings with grunts mixed up in them and sometimes a snoring far away down real snoring yet somehow not honest snoring like you and me and nights you know i know remarked the boy quietly of course i was terrible frightened the shepherd went on yet somehow i couldn't keep away so this very evening before i come down I took a cast round by the cave, quietly, and there, oh, Lord, there I saw him at last, as plain as I see you. Saw who? said his wife, beginning to share in her husband's nervous terror. Why, him, I'm a-telling you, said the shepherd. He was sticking halfway out of the cave, and seemed to be enjoying of the cool of the evening, in a poetical sort of way. He was as big as four cart-horses, and all covered with shiny scales, deep blue scales at the top of him, shading off to a tender sort of green below. As he breathed, there was that sort of flicker over his nostrils that you see over our chalk roads on a baking windless day in summer. He had his chin on his paws, and I should say he was meditating about things. Oh, yes, a peaceable sort of beast enough, and not ramping or carrying on or doing anything but what was quite right and proper. I admit all that. And yet what am I to do? Scales, you know, and claws, and a tail for certain, though I didn't see that end of him. I ain't used to him, and I don't hold with him, and that's a fact. The boy, who had apparently been absorbed in his book during his father's recital, now closed the volume, yawned, clasped his hands behind his head, and said sleepily, "'It's all right, father. Don't you worry. It's only a dragon.' "'Only a dragon?' cried his father. "'What do you mean, sitting there, you and your dragons? Only a dragon, indeed. And what do you know about it?' "'Cause it is, and cause I do know,' replied the boy quietly. "'Look here, father.' "'You know we've each of us got our line. "'You know about sheep and weather and things. "'I know about dragons. "'I always said, you know, that the cave up there was a dragon cave. "'I always said it must have belonged to a dragon sometime, "'and ought to belong to a dragon now, if rules count for anything. "'Well, now you tell me it has got a dragon, and so that's all right. "'I'm not half as much surprised as when you told me it hadn't got a dragon.' "'Rules always come right if you wait quietly. "'Now, please, just leave all this to me, "'and I'll stroll up to-morrow morning. "'No, in the morning I can't. "'I've got a whole heap of things to do. "'Well, perhaps in the evening, if I'm quite free, "'I'll go up and have a talk to him, "'and you'll find it'll be all right. "'Only please don't you go worrying round there without me. "'You don't understand them a bit, "'and they're very sensitive, you know.' "'He's quite right, father.' said the sensible mother. As he says, 
Dragkins is his line and not ours. He's wonderful knowing about book beasts as every one allows. And to tell the truth, I'm not half happy in my own mind, thinking of that poor animal lying alone up there without a bit of hot supper or any one to change the news with. And maybe we'll be able to do something for him. And if he ain't quite respectable, our boy'll find it out quick enough. He's got a pleasant sort of way with him that makes everybody tell him everything. Next day, after he'd had his tea, the boy strolled up the chalky track that led to the summit of the downs, and there, sure enough, he found the dragon stretched lazily on the sward in front of his cave. The view from that point was a magnificent one. To the right and left, the bare and billowy leagues of downs. In front, the vale, with its clustered homesteads, its threads of white roads running through orchards and well-tilled acreage, and, far away, a hint of grey old cities on the horizon. A cool breeze played over the surface of the grass, and the silver shoulder of a large moon was showing above distant junipers. No wonder the dragon seemed in a peaceful and contented mood. Indeed, as the boy approached, he could hear the beast purring with a happy regularity. "'Well, we live and learn,' he said to himself. "'None of my books ever told me that dragons purred.' "'Hello, dragon,' said the boy quietly when he had got up to him. The dragon, on hearing the approaching footsteps, made the beginning of a courteous effort to rise. But when he saw it was a boy, he set his eyebrows severely. "'Now don't you hit me,' he said, "'or bung stones or squirt water or anything. I won't have it, I tell you.' "'Not going to hit you,' said the boy wearily, dropping on the grass beside the beast. "'And don't, for goodness sake, keep on saying don't. I hear so much of it, and it's monotonous and makes me tired.' I've simply looked in to ask how you were, and all that sort of thing. But if I'm in the way, I can easily clear out. I've lots of friends, and no one can say I'm in the habit of shoving myself in where I'm not wanted. No, no, don't go off in a huff, said the dragon hastily. Fact is, I'm as happy up here as the day's long, never without an occupation, dear fellow, never without an occupation. "'And yet between ourselves it is a trifle dull at times.' "'The boy bit off a long stalk of grass and chewed it. "'Going to make a long stay here?' he asked politely. "'Can't hardly say at present,' replied the dragon. "'It seems a nice place enough, but I've only been here a short time, "'and one must look about and reflect. "'and consider before settling down. "'It's rather a serious thing, settling down. "'Besides, now I'm going to tell you something. "'You'd never guess it if you tried ever so. "'Fact is, I'm such a confoundedly lazy beggar.' "'You surprise me,' said the boy civilly. "'It's the sad truth.' the dragon went on, settling down between his paws, and evidently delighted to have found a listener at last. "'And I fancy that's really how I came to be here. You see, all the other fellows were so active and earnest and all that sort of thing, always rampaging and skirmishing and scouring the desert sands and pacing the margin of the sea, and chasing knights all over the place, and devouring damsels, and going on generally. Whereas I liked to get my meals regular, and then to prop my back against a bit of rock and snooze a bit, and wake up and think of things going on, and how they kept going on just the same, you know. So when it happened, I got fairly caught. When what happened, please? asked the boy. "'That's just what I don't precisely know,' said the dragon. "'I suppose the earth sneezed or shook itself, or the bottom dropped out of something. Anyhow, 
there was a shake and a roar and a general stramash, and I found myself miles away underground and wedged in as tight as tight. Well, thank goodness, my wants are few, and at any rate I had peace and quietness, and wasn't always being asked to come along and do something. And I've got such an active mind, always occupied, I assure you. But time went on, and there was a certain sameness about the life. And at last I began to think it would be fun to work my way upstairs, and see what you other fellows were doing. So I scratched and burrowed, and worked this way and that way, and at last I came out through this cave here. And I like the country, and the view, and the people, what I've seen of em. And on the whole I feel inclined to settle down here. What's your mind always occupied about? asked the boy. That's what I want to know. The dragon colored slightly and looked away. Presently he said bashfully, Did you ever, just for fun, try to make up poetry, verses, you know? Course I have, said the boy. Heaps of it. And some of it's quite good, I feel sure. Only there's no one here cares about it. Mother's very kind and all that when I read it to her, and so's father for that matter, but somehow they don't seem to. Exactly, cried the dragon. My own case exactly. They don't seem to, and you can't argue with them about it. Now, you've got culture you have, I could tell it on you at once, and I should just like your candid opinion about some little things I threw off lightly when I was down there. I'm awfully pleased to have met you, and I'm hoping the other neighbors will be equally agreeable. There was a very nice old gentleman up here only last night, but he didn't seem to want to intrude. That was my father, said the boy. "'And he is a nice old gentleman, and I'll introduce you some day if you like. "'Can't you two come up here and dine or something to-morrow?' asked the dragon eagerly. "'Only, of course, if you've got nothing better to do,' he added politely. "'Thanks awfully,' said the boy. "'But we don't go out anywhere without my mother, and to tell you the truth, I'm afraid she mightn't quite approve of you.' You see, there's no getting over the hard fact that you're a dragon, is there? And when you talk of settling down, and the neighbors, and so on, I can't help feeling that you don't quite realize your position. You're an enemy of the human race, you see. Haven't got an enemy in the world, said the dragon cheerfully. Too lazy to make em to begin with. And if I do read other fellows my poetry, I'm always ready to listen to theirs. Oh, dear, cried the boy, I wish you'd try and grasp the situation properly. When the other people find you out, they'll come after you with spears and swords and all sorts of things. You'll have to be exterminated according to their way of looking at it. You're a scourge and a pest and a baneful monster. "'Not a word of truth in it,' said the dragon, wagging his head solemnly. "'Character'll bear the strictest investigation. "'And now there's a little sonnet thing I was working on when you appeared on the scene.' "'Oh, if you won't be sensible,' cried the boy, getting up, "'I'm going off home. "'No, I can't stop for sonnets. "'My mother's sitting up.' I'll look you up to-morrow, some time or other, and do, for goodness' sake, try to realize that you're a pestilential scourge, or you'll find yourself in a most awful fix. Good night. 
the boy found it an easy matter to set the mind of his parents at ease about his new friend they had always left that branch to him and they took his word without a murmur the shepherd was formally introduced and many compliments and kind inquiries were exchanged his wife however though expressing her willingness to do anything she could to mend things or set the cave to rights or cook a little something when the dragon had been poring over sonnets and forgotten his meals as male things will do could not be brought to recognize him formally the fact that he was a dragon and they didn't know who he was seemed to count for everything with her she made no objection however to her little son spending his evenings with the dragon quietly so long as he was home by nine o'clock and many a pleasant night they had sitting on the sward while the dragon told stories of old old times when dragons were quite plentiful and the world was a livelier place than it is now and life was full of thrills and jumps and surprises what the boy had feared however soon came to pass the most modest and retiring dragon in the world if he's as big as four cart horses and covered with blue scales cannot keep altogether out of the public view and so in the village tavern of nights the fact that a real live dragon sat brooding in the cave on the downs was naturally a subject for talk though the villagers were extremely frightened they were rather proud as well it was a distinction to have a dragon of your own and it was felt to be a feather in the cap of the village still all were agreed that this sort of thing couldn't be allowed to go on the dreadful beast must be exterminated the countryside must be freed from this pest this terror this destroying scourge the fact that not even a hen roost was the worse for the dragon's arrival wasn't allowed to have anything to do with it he was a dragon and he couldn't deny it and if he didn't choose to behave as such that was his own lookout but in spite of much valiant talk no hero was found willing to take sword and spear and free the suffering village and win deathless fame and each night's heated discussion always ended in nothing meanwhile the dragon a happy bohemian lolled on the turf enjoyed the sunsets told antediluvian anecdotes to the boy and polished his old verses while meditating on fresh ones one day the boy on walking into the village found everything wearing a festal appearance which was not to be accounted for in the calendar carpets and gay-coloured stuffs were hung out of the windows the church bells clamoured noisily the little street was flower-strewn and the whole population jostled each other along either side of it chattering shoving and ordering each other to stand back the boy saw a friend of his own age in the crowd and hailed him what's up he cried is it the players or bears or a circus or what it's all right his friend hailed back he's a comin who's a comin demanded the boy thrusting into the throng why st george of course replied his friend he's heard tell of our dragon and he's come in on purpose to slay the deadly beast and free us from his horrid yoke oh my won't there be a jolly fight here was news indeed the boy felt that he ought to make quite sure for himself and he wriggled himself in between the legs of his good-natured elders abusing them all the time for their unmannerly habit of shoving once in the front rank he breathlessly awaited the arrival presently from the far away end of the line came the sound of cheering next the measured tramp of a great war-horse made his heart beat quicker and then he found himself cheering with the rest as amidst welcoming shouts shrill cries of women uplifting of babies and waving of handkerchiefs st george paced slowly up the street the boy's heart stood still and he breathed with sobs the beauty and the grace of the hero were so far beyond anything he had yet seen his fluted armour was inlaid with gold his plumed helmet hung at his saddle-bow and his thick fair hair framed a face gracious and gentle beyond expression 
till you caught the sternness in his eyes. He drew rein in front of the little inn, and the villagers crowded round with greetings and thanks and voluble statements of their wrongs and grievances and oppressions. The boy heard the grave, gentle voice of the saint, assuring them that all would be well now, and that he would stand by them and see them righted, and free them from their foe. Then he dismounted, and passed through the doorway, and the crowd poured in after him. But the boy made off up the hill as fast as he could lay his legs to the ground. "'It's all up, dragon!' he shouted, as soon as he was within sight of the beast. "'He's coming! He's here now! You'll have to pull yourself together and do something at last!' The dragon was licking his scales and rubbing them with a bit of house flannel the boy's mother had lent him, till he shone like a great turquoise. "'Don't be violent, boy,' he said without looking round. "'Sit down and get your breath, and try to remember that the noun governs the verb, and then perhaps you'll be good enough to tell me who's coming.' "'That's right. Take it coolly.' said the boy. Hope you'll be half as cool when I've got through with my news. It's only St. George who's coming, that's all. He rode into the village half an hour ago. Of course, you can lick him, a great big fellow like you. But I thought I'd warn you, cause he's sure to be round early, and he's got the longest, wickedest-looking spear you ever did see. And the boy got up and began to jump round in sheer delight at the prospect of the battle. "'Oh, dearie, dearie me,' moaned the dragon. "'This is too awful. "'I won't see him, and that's flat. "'I don't want to know the fellow at all. "'I'm sure he's not nice. "'You must tell him to go away at once, please. "'Say he can write, if he likes.' "'But I can't give him an interview. "'I'm not seeing anybody at present.' "'Now, dragon, dragon,' said the boy imploringly, "'don't be perverse and wrong-headed. "'You've got to fight him some time or other, you know, "'cause he's St. George, and you're the dragon. "'Better get it over, and then we can go on with the sonnets. "'And you ought to consider other people a little, too.' "'If it's been dull up here for you, think how dull it's been for me.' "'My dear little man,' said the dragon solemnly, "'just understand once for all that I can't fight and I won't fight. "'I've never fought in my life, and I'm not going to begin now "'just to give you a Roman holiday.' In old days I always let the other fellows, the earnest fellows, do all the fighting, and no doubt that's why I have the pleasure of being here now. But if you don't fight, he'll cut your head off, gasped the boy, miserable at the prospect of losing both his fight and his friend. "'Oh, I think not,' said the dragon in his lazy way. "'You'll be able to arrange something. "'I've every confidence in you. "'You're such a manager. "'Just run down, there's a dear chap, and make it all right. "'I leave it entirely to you.' "'The boy made his way back to the village in a state of great despondency.' First of all, there wasn't going to be any fight. Next, his dear and honoured friend the dragon hadn't shown up in quite such a heroic light as he would have liked. And lastly, whether the dragon was a hero at heart or not, it made no difference, for St. George would most undoubtedly cut his head off. "'Arrange things indeed,' he said bitterly to himself. The dragon treats the whole affair as if it was an invitation to tea and croquet. The villagers were straggling homewards as he passed up the street, all of them in the highest spirits, and gleefully discussing the splendid fight that was in store. 
The boy pursued his way to the inn, and passed into the principal chamber, where St. George now sat alone, musing over the chances of the fight, and the sad stories of rapine and of wrong that had so lately been poured into his sympathetic ears. "'May I come in, St. George?' said the boy politely, as he paused at the door. "'I want to talk to you about this little matter of the dragon, if you're not tired of it by this time.' "'Yes, come in, boy,' said the saint kindly. "'Another tale of misery and wrong, I fear me. "'Is it a kind parent, then, of whom the tyrant has bereft you, "'or some tender sister or brother? "'Well, it shall soon be avenged.' "'Nothing of the sort,' said the boy. "'There's a misunderstanding somewhere, and I want to put it right.' "'The fact is, this is a good dragon.' "'Exactly,' said St. George, smiling pleasantly. "'I quite understand. A good dragon. "'Believe me, I do not in the least regret "'that he is an adversary worthy of my steel "'and no feeble specimen of his noxious tribe.' "'But he's not a noxious tribe,' cried the boy distressedly. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, how stupid men are when they get an idea into their heads. "'I tell you he's a good dragon, and a friend of mine, "'and tells me the most beautiful stories you ever heard, "'all about old times and when he was little. "'And he's been so kind to mother, and mother'd do anything for him. "'And father likes him, too.' though father doesn't hold with art and poetry much, and always falls asleep when the dragon starts talking about style. But the fact is, nobody can help liking him when once they know him. He's so engaging and so trustful, and as simple as a child. "'Sit down and draw your chair up,' said St. George. "'I like a fellow who sticks up for his friends,' "'and I'm sure the dragon has his good points "'if he's got a friend like you. "'But that's not the question. "'All this evening I've been listening "'with grief and anguish unspeakable "'to tales of murder, theft, and wrong. "'Rather too highly coloured, perhaps, "'not always quite convincing.' but forming in the main a most serious role of crime. History teaches us that the greatest rascals often possess all the domestic virtues, and I fear that your cultivated friend, in spite of the qualities which have won, and rightly, your regard, has got to be speedily exterminated." "'Oh, you've been taking in all the yarns those fellows have been telling you,' said the boy impatiently. "'Why, our villagers are the biggest storytellers in all the country round. It's a known fact. You're a stranger in these parts, or else you'd have heard it already. All they want is a fight. They're the most awful beggars for getting up fights. It's meat and drink to them. Dogs, bulls, dragons, anything, so long as it's a fight.' "'Why, they've got a poor innocent badger in the stable behind here at this moment. "'They were going to have some fun with him to-day, "'but they're saving him up now till your little affair is over. "'And I've no doubt they've been telling you what a hero you were, "'and how you are bound to win in the cause of right and justice and so on. "'But let me tell you, I came down the street just now, "'and they were betting six to four on the dragon freely.' Six to four on the dragon, murmured St. George sadly, resting his cheek on his hand. This is an evil world, and sometimes I begin to think that all the wickedness in it is not entirely bottled up inside the dragons. And yet, may not this wily beast have misled you as to his real character— in order that your good report of him may serve as a cloak for his evil deeds? Nay, may there not be at this very moment some hapless princess immured within yonder gloomy cavern? 
The moment he had spoken, St. George was sorry for what he had said, the boy looked so genuinely distressed. "'I assure you, St. George,' he said earnestly, "'there's nothing of the sort in the cave at all. The dragon's a real gentleman, every inch of him, and I may say that no one would be more shocked and grieved than he would at hearing you talk in that, that loose way, about matters on which he has very strong views.' "'Well, perhaps I've been over-credulous,' said St. George. "'Perhaps I've misjudged the animal. "'But what are we to do? "'Here are the dragon and I, almost face to face, "'each supposed to be thirsting for each other's blood. "'I don't see any way out of it exactly. "'What do you suggest? "'Can't you arrange things somehow?' "'That's just what the dragon said,' replied the boy, rather nettled. "'Really, the way you two seem to leave everything to me, "'I suppose you couldn't be persuaded to go away quietly, could you?' "'Impossible, I fear,' said the saint. "'Quite against the rules. "'You know that as well as I do.' "'Well, then, look here,' said the boy. "'It's early yet.' "'Would you mind strolling up with me and seeing the dragon and talking it over? "'It's not far, and any friend of mine will be most welcome.' "'Well, it's irregular,' said St. George, rising. "'But really, it seems about the most sensible thing to do. "'You're taking a lot of trouble on your friend's account,' he added good-naturedly, "'as they passed out through the door together. "'But cheer up. "'Perhaps there won't have to be any fight after all.' "'Oh, but I hope there will, though,' replied the little fellow wistfully. End of section 7A of Dream Days by Kenneth Graham